A couple weeks ago, we had something called Canada Day. And I was reading in the daily newspaper that uh, Canada had become the first post-national country, meaning that there was no such thing as the Canadian people anymore, or Canadian culture, because we'd moved beyond having nations and cultures into some amorphous Americanized culture that would soon blanket the world. And I thought that this was a very strange thing to say on Canada Day, that there's a natural <laughs> country called Canada, but there are no Canadian people. There are just these amorphous post-national people living here. Well, just about a week and a half before Canada Day, I spent a whole week in the state of Pennsylvania and poetry readings in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and it, just a week in the United States rather convinced me that this is really a different country than the one that we are in presently. Uh, so presumably, if the people who write a total copy for the newspapers would ever go to the United States, they would find out that it is in fact a different country from this with a different sort of people and a different sort of society and culture. But of course, since there's no Canadian people and no Canadian culture, there's no such thing as Canadian poetry. There's just poetry in the English language, you see. Uh, I thought that was amazing. So anyhow, I had that in mind when I was placing Milton Acorn within the context of Canadian literature, which the people who run the country want to bury and say is passé. In my introduction to In a Springtime Instant, I talk about the great generation of Canadian poets. I refer to the years of 1916 through 1926. During that period, no less than 20 important poets were born, at least eight of them going on to win the Governor General's Award for Poetry. Milton Acorn was born into this generation and served as its, as its leading member until his death 26 years ago. The great generation formed the bridge between our poets of the Confederation period, such as Archibald Lampman, Bliss Carman, and Isabella Lindsay Crawford, and our modernist poets, such as Margaret Atwood, Gwendolyn McEwen, and Patrick Lane. And the modernists, in their turn, led to the poets of what might be called the post-Atwood period, such as John B. Lee, Tom Wayman, and Mary D. McKaylee. Indeed, the great generation ensured that the vision of our 19th century poets carried on into and through the 20th century. The importance of our Confederation period writers is that, as interesting and heartfelt as the work may be, and here I fully agree with Margaret Atwood that some pre-Confederation poetry is of high literary value. The poems of pre-Confederation poets like Heavy Siege, Sangster, and Mayer are scarcely more than British-style poems written in Canada, even when they dealt with Canadian topics like the War of 1812 in Upper Canada. These poets possessed little or no Canadian vision, little or no Canadian understanding. And although both Sangster and Mayer were born in Canada, they saw Canada through the English poetic tradition of Keats, Byron, Wordsworth, etc. Our first poet with a Canadian vision was Isabella Valency Crawford, 1850 to 1887. It was Crawford who inspired Dorothy Livesey, and Livesey inspired poets like Atwood. Another important contribution of Acorn and his fellow poets was the establishment of people's poetry. While, fellow, while hints 
And at times more than mere hints of people's poetry can be found in the work of Lampman and Carmen. And while people's poetry as we know it today came to the forefront when Dorothy Lisey published her stunning collection, Day and Night, which won the Governor General's Award in 1944. It was the Acorn Generation that developed it and helped it become Canada's chief poetic tradition. It would be difficult to imagine the people's poetry movement without the work of three of our finest poets, Acorn, Raymond Souster, and Al Purdy. Ted Plantos has called Milton Acorn the lyric heart of a land. I call Acorn the heart and soul of Canadian poetry. And here I interrupt my talk to give a definition of people's poetry for people who don't know. Uh, many years ago, so many years ago that Ryerson was not a university, it was a polytechnic institute I used to teach at Ryerson, and my students asked me to define the term people's poetry. So way back then I wrote this. Although its roots lie deep in the Confederation period, which was 1880 to 1899, people's literature as we know it today, both in poetry and in fiction, has been the central literary tradition of Canada since the mid-1920s, when Frederick Philip Grove published his first Canadian novel, Settlers of the Marsh, 1925. Grove's poetic counterpart was Dorothy Livesey, who published her first collection, Green Pitcher, in 1928, and whose day and night would win the Governor General's Award, 1944, and would set a standard for people's poetry that would be followed by Milton Acorn, George Bowering, Ted Plantos, and many others. People's poetry is founded on two concepts. And here I talk about the classic people's poetry of the great generation. One, that progress can be seen in the human universe. In terms of what might be called social physics, this means that society moves from disorder to order. Thus, society improves, becomes ever more fair, and less governed by social Darwinism. And this is what sets, according to people's poets, society apart from the rest of reality, because we all know that the second law of thermodynamics, which governs the whole universe, is that order inevitably decays into disorder. But in human society, disorder or chaos becomes ever more ordered, according to this way of looking at the world. And the second thing it's based on is the premise that humanity is perfectible within history. That is, humans play a, if not the, major role in their personal and collective salvation from the flaws of human nature. From these two principles, it follows that people's poetry promotes peace, equality, as opposed to freedom, and human goodness. People's poetry opposes racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination. People's poetry opposes classism and class systems. It is, in short, art made for the people, not the elite. People's poetry works to preserve and enrich our natural and human environment. In practice, people's poetry tends to be committed to modernist concepts while retaining key romantic ideals, support socialist, social democratic political movements, oppose large-scale capitalism and its intendant business culture, encourage all people to participate in building their own culture. From the days when Grove and Livesey were writing and publishing their early books, 
realism joined with idealism has been the hallmark of people's literature in Canada. This sets it apart from postmodern imagist and confessional poetries which also are present in our literature today. Leading people's poets today include John B. Lee, Robert Priest, Ronnie Brown, and Chris Fares. <laughs> Two of them are right here in this room. <laughs> Now back to the talk. Now we all understand people's poetry. The family tree of people's poetry, with its roots in the Confederation period, and in this we see a direct line, a direct line, if you actually study Canadian poetry, from Isabella Valencia Crawford, through Dorothy Livesey and Margaret Atwood, and on to Ruth Orson. Likewise, a line runs from Archibald Lampman through Raymond Souster and Milton Acorn and Miriam Waddington and on to Norma West Linder and Chris Fares. Both of them are in the room again. Thanks again, Jim. <laughs> yes. Amazing these people keep showing up. And once again, from Bliss Carmen through Al Purdy and Irving Layton and on to John B. Lee, the leading people's poet of his generation. As a result, we can clearly discern a tradition stretching from Crawford's Old Spooks' Past, Malcolm's Kate and Other Poems, published in 1884, and Lampman's Among the Millet and Other Poems, 1888, to the poetry being published today, a century and a quarter later. Indeed, the majority of Canadian poets writing today claim to be either people's poets or to be writing from that tradition. Most of our contemporary poets trace their literary roots back to the great generation. The role of Acorn within the people's poetry tradition and within the great generation is central. Although poets like Livesey, Layton, Ann Marriott, Purdy, Souster, Atwood, and McEwen were publishing books and winning major awards before Milton Acorn's great decade, it was through his two NC Press titles, More Poems for People and The Island Means Monego, that people's poetry was placed in the minds of not just other poets where it had been for decades, but in the minds of general readers as well. More poems for people shall have sold thousands of copies, a circulation no other Canadian poetry book could achieve. Acorn tirelessly roamed from Atlantic Canada to Vancouver and as far north as Dawson Creek, presenting readings and lectures. A true bard of Canada, Acorn probably gave more poetry readings than any other poet of his time. In this way, he was like Bliss Carmen, also noted for his vigorous poetry readings. And while Acorn was named the People's Poet by his fellow writers in 1970, Carmen, who greatly inspired the young Al Purdy, was the first People's Poet in Canada, the first poet to captivate the general public's imagination. But Acorn's influence on Canadian poetry went far beyond his well-attended readings and his popular books. He maintained friendships with and influenced a great many of our finest poets. And among the poets to pay tribute to Milton Acorn as someone who greatly inspired them were Dorothy Lysey, Irving Layton, Anne Marriott, Al Purdy, Raymond Souster, Eli Mandel, Joe Rosenblatt, J. Michael Yates, Patrick and his brother Red Lane, Margaret Atwood, Bill Bissett, David Donnell, Dennis Lee, Gwendolyn McEwen, Michael Donche, Seymour Maine, Maxine Gad, Peter Trower, Artie Gold, etc. Acorn also led informal poetry workshops in two of English Canada's most important cities, Vancouver at the Advanced Mattress 
and Toronto at the Bohemian Embassy. He also taught creative writing at Toronto's three schools. In this way, he encouraged many younger poets, at least seven of whom would win the Governor General's Award for Poetry. It is true that Acorn would fall out with most of his fellow poets at one time or another, but he still respected them and they him. In the spreading of people's poetry, I like to call Acorn, Souster, and Purdy the three amigos. It was Souster who published Acorn's first full-length book, Jawbreakers, through Contact Press, a publishing house that also involved Louis Dudek and Leighton, two of the finest people's poets to come out of the Montreal scene. And Purdy edited and introduced Acorn's great book, I've Tasted My Blood, as well as two other Acorn collections. Souster also published Purdy's breakthrough collection, Poems for All the Annettes. Furthermore, Souster and, uh, Souster and Purdy won back to back Governor General's Awards for Poetry in 1964 and 1965, respectively. In fact, by 1970, People's Poets had won the GG ten times, and Acorn and his friends would win it six more times <coughs> during the 1970s. And so it continues. The winner of the 2011 Governor General's Award for Poetry is Phil Hall for his collection, Kill Deer. Hall writes directly from the tradition of Acorn and Purdy. Fortunately, Raymond Souster is still with us and presently writing and publishing with great vigor. The last poet of our great generation. And Norma and I just saw him this afternoon. That one strand of poetry has been so central to Canadian literature for 125 years is remarkable. People's poetry touches directly on the spirituality and on the philosophical history that has long distinguished Canada from the United States. As clearly shown by such major anthologies as the New American Poetry, 1960, A Controversy of Poets, 1965, The Contemporary American Poets, 1969, and much more recently, the Autumn House Anthology of Contemporary American Poetry, 2011, what we call people's poetry remains an important, but nonetheless minor, strand south of the border. This is to say that while Phil Hall will win the Governor General's Award up here, such a poet would not likely receive a Pulitzer Prize in the US. Indeed, I believe the most recent people's poet to win the Pulitzer was Philip Levine in 1995. And before that, it was perhaps Rita Dove in 1987. That is only twice in a quarter of a century. I suspect well over one-third of all poets to win a GG during that same 25-year span were people's poets. Now having said all this, I do not want you to think that the poetry written in the 21st century is like Live Seas Day and Night, or Acorns I've Tasted My Blood, or Curdy's caribou horses. It is not. For example, very few poets writing today believe in the perfectibility of humankind, and fewer still are active socialists or communists like Livesey and Acorn had been. Nonetheless, they believe in the people and write for them. In my view, poets such as Phil Hall Nora Westlander and John B. Lee were, and still are, inspired by the poets of our great generation. And I will argue further that Acorn played the central role of his generation. Without the poems he wrote between 1950 and 1986, our poetry would not be what we read today. And here's my little bit for the people who write editorial copy in the papers who say Canadian culture no longer exists. But this is a good thing because we're beyond that. <laughs>
Does this mean that Canadian poetry is in some way better than American poetry or English poetry or Irish poetry? No. But it does mean that Canadian poetry is different. That it is, in fact, Canadian. <laughs>